my ear <laughs> and said, that's going to be our two boys and you. <laughs> and uh, may I say this publicly this morning, the key phrase, if that ever happens at the McKegg house, will be, don't tell mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> turning your Bibles this morning to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, just by way of getting started this morning, um, I do want to thank you, Midway Baptist Church, for allowing me um, to be a youth pastor to these great kids. Um, I never thought I would, I would be in youth ministry, but looking back on it now, I'm having the time of my life uh, with these kids. So thank you, church, and I speak for Noel and I. Thank you for allowing us to minister to our youth. We are having a blast uh, getting to share with them about Christ and help them in their daily lives and letting them drive us crazy and taking them on trips and staying up all night with them and all that stuff. So, uh, so thank you. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read um, the entire chapter just so we get the entire thought um, for this morning. Would you stand if you're, if you're able to in reverence to reading of God's Word this morning? And David said, Is there yet any that is left of a house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul? that I may show kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is of the house of Micah, the son of Amiel, and Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micah, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, Why is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king said unto Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to his house. Therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word this morning. Father, I pray now as we dive into the message that you've laid upon my heart this morning, I pray you'd hide me behind the cross. Father, I pray you'd use me this morning. Father, I cannot preach. I can only be used as a vessel to be preached through. So I pray you preach this morning. Father, let everything that's said and done honor and glorify your name because you alone are worthy. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. If I could title this sermon anything, I would entitle it, Grace, Grace. Grace, Grace. I want us to look at the people that are in this passage of Scripture this morning and since it's being you Sunday, we're going to try to apply this to our younger generation and how we can serve them as ministers, servants, and as a church. Because if there's anything that we need to do as a church, we must reach this younger generation. Amen? 
They are not the future of our church. They are our church, and we must reach this younger generation. The first person we see in this passage of Scripture is King David. Now, many of you know the story of King David. When I say King David, many of you think the lowly shepherd boy who went out to take his brother some food to the battle and slayed the great giant Goliath, the great Philistine. God wrought a great victory for the camp of Israel that day. There are many things that come to mind when you think of King David, but here's what I want you to realize this morning. King David, he had a job to do, and he was ruler over Israel. Now, I want to take you back and give you a little bit of history of what's going on in this time period. You see, Saul was the first king, and then when Samuel anointed David to be the next king, Saul didn't like it. Made him mad. So what did he do? He tried to kill David. Multiple times. David has been running from Saul. And now Saul dies and David takes over the throne. Now it was customary during those times that when a new king would come in and he would take over the throne, he would wipe out every known ancestry to that former king because he didn't want anybody to come up against him to try to take the throne. So what they would do, he pretty much execute every single one of them. It'd be done. And a new reign would take place. But we see David here not acting in that way. In verse 1, you hear him say, Is there anyone I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Now David and Jonathan had a very special relationship. Jonathan was Saul's son. But David and Jonathan were best friends. They were close as any two best friends could be. And now Jonathan has died in battle as well. And so for Jonathan's sake, he wants to show kindness to someone in Saul's family. That's a pretty good king, don't you think? Here's what I want you to get this morning, churches. We're just getting started. There's a king, King Jesus. And he's just. And he could wipe out this whole world of sin. But for another J name's sake, but for Jesus' sake... He wants to show kindness. He wants to show grace. He wants to show compassion. And as we dive into the story, we're going to leapfrog off of that this morning and just show you how God wants to show kindness and compassion. And I believe He really wants to show it to a younger generation. The youth of our country. Because guess what? They need Him the most. They go through so many things on a daily basis. I'm blessed to have been a youth minister now for two years. If anybody needs grace, it's this younger generation. Because so many of them have strayed so far. And they're so full of other things. But there's a grace of God that can reach the lowest sinner. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Let's jump into the message. After King David... We bump into this servant. His name is Ziba. Now, if I didn't pronounce that right, y'all just forgive me. Okay? But Ziba, in today's terms, he would be known as a tattletale. <laughs> nobody likes a tattletale, do they? No, everybody, nobody likes a tattletale. You see, because when David sent for him and he came before David, David says, does anybody can show kindness to? Well, oh, Ziba, he didn't hold back. He went ahead blurting it out. He didn't know if David was telling the truth or not. He said, but I'm going to tell you where this guy's at. If you want to show him kindness or you want to kill him, pretty much you go ahead. But I'll tell you. As Ziba begins to go through things, and he starts tattling. But let's, look who he's tattling to. He's tattling to the king. That's very important. He's tattling to the one person who could fix the situation. How many times do we, and I'm guilty of it, and I'm a youth pastor, do we tattle about this younger generation and how messed up they are and how bad they are and how they're going the wrong way? But we tattle to the wrong people. We tattle to preachers. We tattle to our spouses. We tattle to our friends. But church, may I encourage you. Yes, this younger generation, there's so many of them that are going the wrong way. They're messed up. they got so much stuff going on. But we need to tattle to the king. 
We need to tattle to the one who can fix all this mess. Who can fix these kids. Who can save them and give them a new life. So I encourage you in the days ahead, yes, you're going to see things on the news about this younger generation. You're going to see that teen pregnancy skyrocketing. You're going to see all of these things going on in our school system and how these kids are doing things they never should be doing. You may have heard of a mass shooting that takes place in a school. Maybe somewhere out west, midwest, or even over here. And how these kids, and we tattle to everybody else. And we sit there and we say, this younger generation is so messed up. Yeah, it is. But I want to talk to God about it. Because he's the one who can fix it. I firmly believe I'm looking at a bunch of Zybas this morning. And may I encourage you this morning, tattle to the king. Talk to God about it this week. Maybe you've got grandchildren. Maybe you've got children. Maybe you've got nieces and nephews that aren't going the right way. Don't wait for a family reunion to talk about them or get on Facebook or whatever you do or call somebody. Get in your prayer closet and talk to God about it. Because he can come down and he can touch them. And he can make them a son or daughter in Christ. And he can make their life new. So I encourage you this morning. Talk to the king. If you're going to tattle. And if you're going to tattle on me and you don't like the way I'm preaching, talk to God about it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> don't talk to my wife, please. All right? Talk to God. Talk to God. But I like how Ziba is. You see, Ziba was not general in his information that he gave. He was very, very specific, to be honest. Let's look at that passage. See how specific he is. Ziba said, what condition he was in. He said right there in verse 3, yeah, he has a son and he's lame on his feet. And the king said, where is he? Ziba said where he was. I love how specific he is. May I encourage you this also. When you tattle to the king, be specific about who you're tattling about. Don't be general with God. Don't just say, God, I pray for our younger generation and just leave it at that. God wants specifics. The king wants specifics. You tell them where they are, who they are, and tell them what condition they're in. God already knows, but he desires communication of his servants. So tell them exactly where it is. Now you talk about specifics. You say, preacher, can you help me out with that? Sure I can. If you're newlyweds in here, I'm going to talk to you about a little game that married people play. Okay? And, and you may have this scenario going on. You look at each other. My wife and I do this all the time. Right, honey? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we look at each other and we say, let's go out to eat. And we get excited. My wife's a great cook. I've never had anything that she's made that's been bad. But I love going out to eat too. And she needs a break, right? Because we have Hudson. Anybody that knows Hudson knows we need a break. Okay? <laughs> all right? So, we need a break. So, she said, let's go out to eat. I said, all right, sounds good. So, we get a shower. We get ready to go. Get the kids ready. And that's always a catastrophe. And get them buckled in, ready to go. And we hop in the car. Turn the radio on. Okay? I'm going down the road. We forgot something. Where you want to eat? And we start playing this game. Sweetheart, what do you want? It don't matter. Whatever you want. Nah, you pick. Nah, you pick. I'll eat wherever. And it goes back and forth until I finally say a place and she says, well, I don't want to eat there. I said, then you do have a preference. <laughs> You do know where you do want to go to eat. Just say it. My goodness. And then we have to pray in the car before we go in, ask for forgiveness and all this other stuff. When we finally get there. <laughs> Newlyweds, you'll play that game a lot. <laughs> it's fun. But I really like it when she's specific. See, sometimes I look at her and I say, Sweetheart, what do you want for dinner? And she'll say, Pizza. That's pizza. 
We could go to Side Street. We could go to the Brick. We could go to Domino's. We could go to Little Caesars. <laughs> we could go to Papa John's. We could go to Buck's. We go to Wolverine. Where do you want to go? I want specifics of where you want to go. And praise the Lord when she looks at me and says, let's go to Pete's Inn on Asheville Highway. I'm like, glory, that's where I was talking about. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's my favorite place. If y'all ever want to take me out to dinner, that's my favorite place. I love going down there. They lose money on me because preachers know how to eat. Okay? And I got a system. If anybody wants to know my system, just talk to me after service. I'll get you set up. I, I can do it right. But specifics. Be specific when you're talking to the king. Probably one of the greatest examples of this in my life was my mom. My mom, uh, many of you know, she's played the piano since she was 12 years old. She plays by ear. Um, she does a fantastic job. I love to hear my mom sing and play the piano. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my parents took me to church all the time. Um, but when God called me to preach, I ran from my calling and I began to do things out here in the world that I, that I knew God didn't like, so God would leave me alone. Well, I can remember, I got into the alcohol scene, I got into the party scene, and I was doing things I should never be doing. But my mom never wavered for praying for me. And I can remember to this day that I lived in the basement of my parents' house. It was fully furnished. Nobody ever bothered me, praise the Lord. And I, it was nice. And I had my own TV down there. Everybody just left me alone. Well, I'll never forget, my mom's piano was upstairs. And she would sit up there and play the piano. And I would be laying down there on the couch. It would be about 7 o'clock at night. Now, any of you know, the party scene, you don't get started till about 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I'm sitting there taking a nap, getting ready to go out. Well, my mom would be up there. And she starts playing what is now my favorite hymn. She starts singing, I Must Tell Jesus. And she'd get to that chorus. And, it, and she'd get choked up as she was singing. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear these burdens alone. She'd get choked up right there. You know what that burden that she couldn't handle on her own was? It was me. It was her son that had a call on his life to preach the gospel that wasn't doing what God called him to do, that was laying down there in the basement getting ready to go out and drink with his buddies and do things that I knew I never should have been doing. She was specific to the king. That's who she was tattling to. She was tattling to the king on me, and she was being real, real specific. She wasn't saying all the other burdens in her life. She said, God, would you help my boy? God, would you reach down and touch my boy? God, I know you're the only one that can turn his life around. Would you do something to get his attention? So that he knows you're real, so that he accepts the calling upon his life. And he did. And now I'm the most unworthy person, but I'm here in front of you today. Lived a life of sin and turmoil. But I'm thankful for a Ziba in my life that went before the king and tattled about me and was specific. Now let's look at Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the next person we bump into in this passage of Scripture. The Bible is very specific about Mephibosheth. He's a son of Jonathan. But there's one characteristic that's very, very important. It says he's lame on his feet. Now, I'm not talking about the Californian surfer dude lame. Like that's not cool. I'm talking about he can't walk. The end of the passage says he's lame on both of his feet. Handicaps. That's what we would say today. Mephibosheth was handicapped. I want to tell you, there's a, if anybody knows about handicaps, it's this younger generation. You see, I've been in ministry for two years. And I sit here and I watch and I hear kids and they focus so much on their so-called handicaps that they don't focus on the other good things around them. You see, I can take a young lady who can make straight A's. She can be, have the most outgoing personality. But yet she can look in the mirror and her appearance doesn't match up to the other girls that the boys flock to. And her appearance, even though she will not sit there and have joy in the way God created her, and she's beautiful in God's eyes, and there's a, there's a man down the road that she's beautiful too, 
that's going to love her like Christ loved the church, she'll sit there in front of that mirror and she'll say, I'm not beautiful, that's my handicap. And she'll have all these esteem issues her whole life, even though she's a straight-A student and she has an outgoing personality. I see young men who can get along with anybody, friendly, but they look at these sports icons in their high schools and they say, well, I'm not as tall as he is or I can't run as fast as they can and I can't do all this stuff. And so they sit there and they say, well, I'm not as good as they are, so I'm just going to sit right here. They handicap themselves. This younger generation knows all about handicaps because they do it to themselves every single day. But I'm going to tell you the number one handicap that goes on with our younger generation, it's sin. Pure and simple, it's sin. I have never seen sin as rampant as it is today in our younger generation. I'm only 28 years old. That's not very old, okay? I didn't go through half the things these kids are going through in school nowadays. Didn't go through half of them. These kids are just faced with sin on a daily basis. And sin cripples them. It handicaps them. And they don't even realize it. You see, it used to be that people that were handicapped with sin, we took the gospel to. Because guess what? They couldn't come get it for themselves. You had to take it to them. Now, you know what's happening? The world's picked up on that. They're so handicapped with sin that the world brings sin to them. They don't have to go look for sin. Okay? Some of you that are older, you can probably remember the day where you had to go out and look for trouble to get into. They don't have to do that nowadays. Trouble comes and finds them. They can... A simple click on the internet, a simple Instagram post, a simple text message, a simple get-together at a friend's house that you never knew did these things, and all of a sudden you're wrapped up right in the middle of it, and if you don't fit in, you're not cool, and you're not going to be accepted, and you're not going to be able to hang out with these type of people anymore. Little sleepovers at houses, and all of a sudden, mom and dad of this sleepover were supposed to be there, and they're not there anymore. Sin is absolutely brought forward to them. And it's fed to them on a daily basis. Poor Mephibosheth. That guy needed some help. You know, someone who's lame on both their feet, they got to have help to get anywhere they go. Okay, and this is before the time of modern technology. So this guy had servants that had to carry him everywhere he went. He needed help. So King David finds out who Mephibosheth is and he sends some servants to fetch him out. I'm thankful that the king is still sending servants to go fetch out Mephibosheth. I'm thankful for a man of God one day who was just being a servant, who came and preached to my heart, who fetched me out. He came to where I was at. Church, I'm telling you, I'm looking at a bunch of servants in here. i got some great men of God that are in here right now. I'm so unworthy to be preaching today. You should be. But I'm thankful for you. Thank you for taking me underneath your wing. i got Sunday school teachers in here. we got VBS workers. we got youth committee members. we got all sorts of people that are servants of the King. He's called us to go out. Go to where they are. I'm glad those servants of the king didn't say, man, his, his people will bring him by where the king is sooner or later and we'll just snag him in. No. They didn't wait. They went on the king's instruction. They went and they fetched him out. Went and got him. And they brought him to the king. Church, that's what we need to do. May I encourage you, servants of the king, as I am today, we have to go out and we have to fetch them out. And we have to bring them to the king. They can't get here on their own. They don't know no better. This younger generation, they're crippled by sin. They're lame on their feet. They're not going to come to church. We have to go get them to come to church. We have to go to where they are and love on them and show them that we care. We have to be servants of the king. And the servants of the king, well, they bring Mephibosheth in. And Mephibosheth... <laughs> He thinks it's all over. You know a lot of young people, that's what they think when they come to church. They sit here and they look at a congregation and they think, this is a group of people that's got it all together. Because <laughs> they come to church. And they look at their handicaps and they say, I'm not fit to go there 
because I've got all this going on in my life. I'm not going to be good enough. I'm not good enough to go to church. Because guess what? That's what the enemy wants them to think. He doesn't want them to get to the king. But here's what I want you to think about. When Mephibosheth got to the king, remember, he's still lame on both of his feet. He just didn't figure out how to walk. The king's servants carried him. Somebody had to. They fetched him out and had to get him to the king. Church, I'm telling you, we got to get them. We have to get them. They have to get to the king. And I love King David. As he's sitting there, Mephibosheth comes before him, scared to death, thinking, I'm going to get judged. I may get executed. I know who this guy is. I'm going to tell you, a lot of this younger generation, they know who Jesus is. They come in. They're like, oh, I'm going to get judged. <laughs> That's the one thing a young person thinks about all the time. Judgment. How am I going to be judged? How am I going to be looked at? What are they going to do to me when I come? But King David, he's sitting there with loving arms of compassion and grace. And he sits there and he looks at Mephibosheth. He says, I'm going to give you the land of your father. All this stuff. And Mephibosheth, he falls down at the king's feet. May I tell you this, when this younger generation, when they come in contact with the king, and it's a real one-on-one -on -one time, they will fall down. They realize, I'm not good enough. I can't do this on my own. I'm so unworthy. And the king sits there, and he shows grace and compassion. I really like this part, and I don't want you to miss this, and I'll be done. He says, he will eat at my table continually. Now, the king's table in this passage of Scripture is a picture of grace. The king's table was a very prominent thing. Not everybody got to eat at the king's table. That was a special place to be. He says, he'll eat bread at my table continually. So here's what I want you to think about. You got Mephibosheth. He can't walk. They carry him to the king's table. And they put him in that chair. And they slide him right under that table of grace. Now here's my question for you. What's under that table of grace? His handicap. When Mephibosheth was eating at the king's table, nobody knew he was lame on his feet. Nobody knew the circumstances he was in. You know why? Because he was eating at the king's table. I'm thankful every single day that the king's table is high enough for all of my handicaps, all of my shortcomings, all the mess that I've been in in my life to go underneath that table of grace. And so that when people look at me, yeah, they may see my past, but they look and say, where's it at? I'll tell you where my past is. It's under a table of grace. And I get to sit at the king's table. And feast daily. Am I worthy to sit at the king's table? Absolutely not. The most unworthy person in this room to sit at the king's table. And I sit here and I think about Mephibosheth. Oh, how he thought. This is it. Oh, it really was it. Now he gets to feast at the king's table every single day. I'm thankful for a king that has grace and compassion. I'm thankful that the day that I was the Mephibosheth, I had some servants that came and carried me to the king. And now, I get to eat at his table. And everything that was wrong with me, that didn't meet the standard of the king, it's underneath the table of grace. Thankful for grace this morning. Amen? Amen. During this invitation time, we're going to have a song playing. But here's what I want you to think about this morning. Have you been to the table? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never, ever 
felt the grace of God. But I hear, I'm here to tell you this morning, there is a king who is waiting with open arms and he's gonna, he'll wrap his loving arms around you and he'll make you a son or daughter in Christ and you'll get to eat at the king's table. Maybe this morning, you're at the king's table. But you're not being who all you should be. Maybe you're taking it for granted that you're sitting at the king's table. Maybe you forgot what all's underneath the table. You're looking at the feast on the top, but you're forgetting what God covered on the bottom. That's all under that table. And you forgot who you once were before grace came along. Maybe you just want to come and thank Him for it a little bit. During this song today, you can pray, you can come, worship. You, you do whatever God tells you to do. And then we're going to go forward with our baptism service after the invitation. I'm excited about that. It's always good. But this morning, you come as the Lord leads you. You pray. Feast at His table this morning. If you've never been... We'll be here for you. We'll be servants of the King, and we'll take you to Him this morning. Let's pray together before the song. Father, we thank you for another time just to come to your house. Father, we thank you for, Lord, showing your grace and compassion to us. Lord, your grace is unmatched. Personally, I want to thank you for putting me at the table and for covering all of my mess, all of my handicaps. Lord, I pray if there's one in here this morning that doesn't know you as personal Savior, Lord, I pray that they come this morning so that they can feast at the King's table. Father, if there's one in here this morning that's taking it for granted that they're sitting at the King's table, Father, would you help them? Lord, just to remember who they were before grace came along. Father, we pray for our youth. Lord, there's such a lost young generation out there that need to hear Jesus. Lord, you've got a place at the table for them if they'll just accept it. Help us as servants to go out and to serve them and to fetch them out and to bring them to the king. Let the remainder of this service honor and glorify your name. First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.